Alleluia, Alleluia. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When the messengers of John the Baptist had left, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who dress luxuriously and live sumptuously are found in royal palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom scripture says, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. Yet the least of the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people who listened, including the tax collectors who were baptized with the baptism of John, acknowledged the righteousness of God. But the Pharisees and scholars of the law who were not baptized him reject the plan of God for themselves. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't let that first reading go by without commentary. Historically, Isaiah is usually called the prophet of, of the Messiah. He, he's the one who most clearly predicted, talked about the coming of the Messiah. And, and even the gospel quotes him, behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. So he's well known in scripture in antiquity and during the time of Jesus and even now. He's telling the people of Israel that you were beat up. You were really messed up. And he uses metaphors of family life. And he's, the reference is in reference to the fact that they had been destroyed as a nation. They were on a hiatus out of Israel. They were abandoned. They were tortured. Their land was, was empty. It was gone. And the quote is, not one stone was left upon a stone. So they, Israel, is talking to, uh, Isaiah is talking to Israel as if it's a woman. And that woman is married to God. It's a metaphor. And God expresses to her, okay, you were barren, you did not bear fruit, but now you can sing a song. Now, why even mention that? Well, if someone in those days was barren, did not have children, it was looked upon as a curse from God. That's not the case now, of course. We understand that that's not the case. But that's the philosophy of the Semite mind. So in order to carry that out a little further, you didn't have, this is God talking to Israel, you bore no fruit, you bore no children, you, you were like an abandoned person. And now, get ready, because your children are going to be so many that your, your tent has to be enlarged and stakes have to be put out because everyone is going to fit in that. You're going to have so many children. Okay, it's a metaphor, but it really is God speaking to the people of Israel. You were nothing before and you're going to be great. The people of Israel are going to be great, which is, which is important. And... What was taken away from you will be returned. You were thought to be a widow, but now your husband is your maker. Your husband is the Holy One of Israel. Your husband, your husband is God. That's quite a gift that Isaiah, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is given the people of Israel, telling you are God's espoused. Now, there are references to that metaphor many times throughout scripture, but to be married to God, it's not with a ring on your finger, but God being so in love with the people of Israel that he makes them grow and grow and grow. And he, he remembers, now before I hid my face from you, when you were up in Babylon and you had no hope, I hid my face from you because you, you were bad, you, 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 you sinned, you 
made deals with the pagans. You put pagan temples in, on my land. But now, reversing my outburst of wrath, I take pity on you. I remember you. And I love you. And my love never leaves you. Such a beautiful reading and reality. I, I like to reference married couples too. I, I don't like the fact that shame and disgrace were placed upon the, the shoulder of the woman metaphor. In our society, that's still the case. You know, the, you have shelters for unwed mothers and their children. And where are the fathers? I'm sorry, you know, if you can make a child, be responsible for the child. And our society is just inundated with children whose fathers have abandoned them. And I, again, it's not, this is not what the reading is about, but to make it applicable for our contemporary life, we have to realize that. And what God does to the abandoned woman is he rewards her spiritually with more, more and more children, more than she can handle. But that's Israel he's talking about. He's not talking about a particular woman. But in our society, too many women are abandoned. And we have shelters for children who are with their mothers sometimes. Sometimes abandoned women with their children. And that's a main major concern of ours in our society and definitely in our church. These are women who need our support in many ways. And the answer is not to, well, let's just kill off their children. That's stupid. You know, that's insane. It, it, it's inhuman. So we don't go that direction. But politics, you know, gets in the way. It's, oh, yeah, let's just, you know, abort the kids before they're born. Just get rid of them. They're just a nuisance. This is, this is God forbid. This is a disgrace. This is a, 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 a disgrace against nature. It's inhuman. And of course, the church stands for the rights of the children as well as, as the, the, those, the women who bore the children. But my concern is the men. Get off your butts. If you had a relationship with a woman and that relationship led to a child or pregnancy, it's your responsibility, pure and simple. Even God took responsibility. So if God can take responsibility for the, the woman, Israel, that he temporarily abandoned due to the Babylonian captivity, well then we need to take responsibility for the women with whom we have relationships. And that's, that's our church, that's our faith. So it's not just Isaiah and the old way of thinking. That's contemporary thought. And we're obligated to follow that. Just touching the gospel, we realize that what Jesus is pointing out is John. Sunday I mentioned that most of the, the paintings of John the Baptist, if he's not baptizing Jesus, he's pointing, okay, pointing to Jesus. And you'll hear that again on Sunday scripture. And here Jesus is pointing to John because it was John who was the precursor of Jesus, John, who was the, the, the one who was going to announce as the messenger of God, the coming of the Messiah. And it's beautiful because, okay, Jesus gives us his word, but he's not just the rabbi, he's not just another teacher. Jesus gave us his word as the word, capital W, of God. So what he says goes. So he's calling us in this scripture to listen to John, apply it to ourselves, and then follow Jesus as we prepare for Christmas.